Hello and welcome back to season number two of the Adventures in CRE audio series. I'm your host, Sam Carlson, and today we are joined by guest Ron Rohde. Let's get started. Welcome to the Adventures in CRE audio series. Join Michael Belasco and Spencer Burton as they pull back the curtain on everything commercial real estate and introduce you to some of the top minds in the industry. If you want to take your skills to the next level and be part of a growing community of CRE professionals across the world, this is for you. All right, you guys. Hey, thank you for tuning in here. Season two. We're really excited. We've got an amazing guest actually in studio today. And by the way, before we jump into it, if you would like, you can actually see this video on YouTube, on your channel, right, Spencer? That's right. Yeah. And as well as Michael's. Michael's sure. Okay. So if you're not subscribed to either their playlist or their channels, rather, go over to YouTube, search them up and subscribe. And you can actually see this episode in video. Michael's, exciting. Michael's beautiful face. Yeah. yeah. Michael's beautiful We're face. We're all very handsome gentlemen here. That's exactly <laughs> right. So we are, as always, joined by co-creators of the Adventures in CRE audio series, as well as website, Accelerator Program, uh, Spencer Burton and Michael Blasco. What's up, guys? Yeah, great to be here. And uh, today we've got an amazing guest, Ron Rohde. Ron, how you doing? Living the dream, living the dream. That's awesome, man. <laughs> That's awesome. So before we jump into it, Spencer, would you mind taking a second and give us kind of an intro to uh, Ron there? Yeah, I've got a great little bio here. Uh, so Ronald Rohde, uh, seasoned commercial real estate attorney uh, practicing in Florida and Texas, right, Ron? Uh, he's over, he has over 10 years of experience with commercial transactions, leasing, and investment he recently served as general counsel for a regional real estate developer overseeing the development of over $500 million of projects throughout Alabama, Texas, and Tennessee. He's currently focused on commercial real estate transactions, what, about 80% in Dallas and DFW uh, area. Uh, he received his undergraduate degree from Cornell University, go Big Red, uh, <laughs> and his Juris Doctor from the University of Miami. And most importantly, he is our new ACRE legal contributor. So it's pretty exciting. Well, in a subsequent episode, we'll talk about our new ACRE legal section and what Ron has planned for that section. But uh, in this episode, I just like to get to know Ron yeah. a little bit better. Well, I know I know him better than, than well, others do. Well, but, uh, yeah, and maybe let's start there. Maybe. So Ron, how did you come to uh, meet these fine fellows? Yeah, that's a uh, thanks for the warm intro. Uh, definitely happy to be here. I've known Spencer uh, probably going on what four or yeah. five years. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I'm active in the North Texas Cornell Real Estate Council, and so it's just a group of professionals that get together, chat about the industry, um, and that's how I met Spencer. Yeah, we we, we do monthly lunches, uh, get together with you know uh, alumni of Cornell University who are in real estate, and and so Ron and I met doing that. Um, and uh, we share some mutual interests, and so we've become friends. So, so Ron, you went to Cornell as well, correct? That's right. That's so, right. all three of you guys went to school. Now, were you in school at the same time? No, because I went there for my undergrad. Uh, so okay. I was yeah. there in early two thousand. Yeah. Okay. So we have this amazing new um, legal feature coming to the website. Yep. Maybe Spencer, let's talk about that a little bit. Why or why do that? Why is that important to have there? And then kind of talk about your background a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. So again, we'll we'll get more in depth on sure. the ACRE legal section in a subsequent episode. But uh, we've seen that there's a clear overlap between uh, the legal elements of a real estate deal and the real estate financial analysis that goes into a deal. Um, uh, and often there's a disconnect, uh, unfortunately. And 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 so Michael and I aren't uh, attorneys. Um, we are, you know, in in our professional worlds, we've certainly interacted with our, our attorneys and we understand the, the sensitivities that go around it. And so, uh, about a year ago, Ron, uh, we, we started talking about this idea of sharing in the same way that we share our models, sharing uh, legal documents mm -hmm. uh, with ACR readers. Uh, and, and Ron's a perfect one for that, given his, his breadth and depth of experience uh, in, in the field. Yeah. Um, but for this episode, you know, I'd love to learn more about Ron's background, um, upbringing. So maybe uh, let's start there. Uh, pretend like this is an interview, and uh, you're you're giving us your your three minute Ron elevator speech. Uh, who are you? Where are you from? Uh, and and what brings you here today? Yeah, great. 
So the three minute elevator says I'm a, I'm a near Texas native, um, family moved here in the mid nineties. Um, and our family has also been pretty active in real estate. So my mom was a mortgage broker and, and did the sales side as well. And we've always owned rental properties. So mostly SFR and, and single family and amassed this portfolio of you know, spread out houses. And as soon as I turned 16, they're like, great, we're so excited. Here's your new car. Go run these keys to this tenant. Go meet this <laughs> contractor to let him into this house. And you know, while it was kind of a chore for me, it was also kind of interesting. And I, I really like just the general concepts that bring people into real estate investing. It's an asset, it's uh, cash flowing, it's paying down debt. There's, there's great demand for it. Um, so I, I definitely grew up in that. And then when I went away for college, I went to Cornell from Texas and was working in for a while. And then I went to law school. It's always been something that's in the back of my mind of, okay, how can I take my my education? You know, as an economics major in Cornell and then law school, you just have this great toolkit. How can I take this and bring it back and do something that's really great and, and um, you know fulfilling? So fast forward to my legal career. It's you know been about ten years of practicing, and I've just been exposed to all aspects of real estate investing you know, from the from the easiest single family entity formation, somebody wants to invest in a uh, rental property uh, as a side gig, um, short-term rentals, you know, for a while, Airbnb, everybody wanted to do that on their own. And, you know, even uh, my wife and I dabbled in that too. So we had a, a townhome in uptown Dallas. And when we moved out, we, we left all our furniture and that was a, a phenomenal experience. You know, it was very profitable. Um, Time consuming, but, but it was <laughs> it was a, it more so was just a great experience to kind of get into that hospitality mode and realize well, when you have all these turnover and you have these guests coming in, they're going to ask questions. Where do I go for this? And where can I get a hamburger at at one a.m.? Mm -hmm. um, and then they expect you, the host, you know, who's me, you know me as a, as a lawyer living next door. Why do you expect me to answer? But Anyway, so so we've experimented that, you know, in addition to owning a bunch of single family rentals, um, trying to move out of those and invest more personally and, and supporting my family. I think, you know, on my mom and my dad's side, we have a big family. And everybody has commercial real estate. So uh, I'm always asked to review these contracts and uh, <laughs> give my advice on what they should do because they say, oh, we have a lawyer in the family. Andy does real estate. You're the guy. Well, so, you know, what I've always found unique about Ron, uh, compared to many of the attorneys that, that I've interacted with over the years, is he understands the business side as well as any. Well, I was anyone. just going to say that because you know a lot of people when they go to law school, they don't even know what kind of law they're going to practice. Yeah, you know, yeah. they fall and into it, right? Exactly. So, was I mean for you, it sounds like you knew the path that you wanted to go on, and you just went right at it. Is that right? Yeah. Um to that aspect, you know, University of Miami has a phenomenal real estate program uh, just with all the, the construction and development issues, but they have a great program. So that was definitely part of it. Um, it's something that I had in my you know narrow window of options. You know, I knew I wasn't going to be a criminal defense attorney. I wasn't going to do um, family law and that type of stuff. Were you exploring other career paths even before you decided to just focus back in on real estate it sounds like you were there you know as a child and then you left but it seems like you kind of it seems like you kind of always yeah i mean i i definitely have interests in other areas and so my mom is chinese uh, so i grew up speaking mandarin chinese and, and i still do speak mandarin i have uh, a, a solid client stable you know that's uh, overseas or local that does speak chinese and that's been a great you know section of my practice because I do speak that language and facilitating foreign investment into the US continues to be part of how I bring money in for commercial real estate. Because uh, again, th those two areas and expertise really overlap. Asians love real estate, they love investing in the US, and I'm that bridge uh, to help facilitate that investment and purchase. So you practice, most of your 
deal working on deals? Is that here in the Dallas Fort Worth area? Is that where you work on most of your transactions right now? Or what is your business like today? I would say throughout the state of Texas, um, you know, it's, it's really not limited to DFW. It's Houston, Austin are really hot markets, um, anywhere in the San Antonio, but yeah, Dallas is, is up there, but it's not too mm-hmm. skewed by any means. Yeah. So w- when you look at property type, uh, is there a property type that you have more exposure to? Um, and so that's the first question. And then the second is, uh, are, are there considerations, uh, between property types, um, meaning are, are certain property types, um, do they take more work or are they more from a legal standpoint, more complex uh, than other property types? Yeah. I mean, I think I tend to focus on more of the, the bread and butter, you know, multifamily, low rise office, um, light industrial warehouse type of, uh, structures and retail, you know, traditional single story shopping centers. Um, and again, that's just kind of a function of who the people I know and yeah. what my experience has been and, and whatever your experience is, it tends to, uh, you get more of that experience. And I, I know that tends to be true as people develop their careers, they get known for, okay, well, Ron helped me with this apartment before I'm going to refer him to somebody else for an apartment. Um, and, and then as a result, then you know, maybe there's a type that I don't do. And that has to do with, uh, you know, assembling parcels or, or, um, getting zoning changes and the use. Um, I think high rise buildings are a little bit, you know, something I haven't had a ton of exposure to where you've got to assemble parcels and get approvals from the city and the county and, and state environmental releases. I mean, that's just really massive projects uh, that I haven't done a ton of. So, so the land use, the land use areas. Exactly. Where, so, but all the other, are you more, are you more on like, acquisition dispositions that is that where you see a lot of are you seeing a lot of uh work looking at leases things like that where are you more focused on or are you touching upon yeah i think acquisition disposition and then operations which includes the leasing any you know, vendor contracts and then uh, minor city interactions that's that's where we do a lot and then financing too you know so being able to review those financing documents and be able to opine on where there's some flexibility, where the market is. Um, and I think Spencer alluded to this earlier, but what I really love about my job is being able to work with the, the deal points and say, this is what we're seeing. Do you want to push it? Do you have leverage in this particular transaction to push because you gave me your wish list of, of 14 items that you want to change? And I'm going to tell you, the landlord's not going to bend over backwards for a 4% of their total leasable, you know, great. You're, you're paying good rent. You're a good tenant. I get it, but you're not going to get everything. You don't have leverage, you're, not, yeah. you're not moving the needle. <laughs> and here. it depends yeah. on the market too. Right. So, yeah. so if that building's at 50% occupancy and you're still 3%, yeah. you, you still have some leverage. Or you're, or you're an apple. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they're a small percentage of NRA, but they, uh, they're somewhat, of, a lot of, they're somewhat of an anchor. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They're not the- right. So I like to guide people through that instead of just taking their 14 questions and then, going down the list with the landlord and fighting for every single one. Meanwhile, billing by the hour. Um, and then to come back to the client and say, well, I got three of them for you. And here's a check, you know, here's an yeah. invoice for $17,000. And here's why basically mm-hmm. you hit them earlier on before you go down that path. Yeah. Because, kind of because I want, that. I want our interests to be more aligned in the sense that I want this you know, deal to go through. If it's a good fit for you, if you're coming in with expectations that, Hey, I, I will only do this if we can get half of these changed. I want to tell you up front, you're probably not going to get all these changed. And that said, you know, let's work with your broker. Let's work with what your business needs are um, and what your investment goals are. But if, if getting seven out of the 14 is really key or critical to doing this, let's really take a step back and whether you want me to, to run to the, you know, the other side and fight for all 14. Because I want you to be successful. I want my clients. I, I I have the you know mentality for really a long term partnership. I want you to be successful so that you make money on this deal. You make money on future deals, and hopefully you're going to hire me on the next the next turn. Yeah. So how often do you see? So you know, a lot of times we talk about it as all right. Here are the business terms, and here are the lawyer terms, right? And you know, the business terms is is worked out between 
know, the people who are doing the transaction and then the lawyers go and figure out a lot of times. What's been your experience in terms of that transaction? Do you find yourself and the clients that you're dealing with, are you finding it more that you are in on the business terms more or are you, you find yourself sort of, okay, this has already been worked out and we're already down the road and now here you're coming in. Do you find yourself on both sides just in terms of the clients that you are? No, I would, I would probably still say I'm, I'm still always going to be at that lawyer terms. So um, you don't find people bringing you in early on? Uh, not that to, early. You okay. know, it's, eh, I don't think it's a client that comes to me and says, Hey Ron, what, what should we offer for this property based on your experience? It's more, we've hammered out 10 items on an LOI and there's still a lot of business terms about you know, feasibility periods or should it be 60 days or 90 days or 30 days. Um, what kind of contingencies, what percentage should we go hard? That's, that's a question that I can feel out that is maybe different than the broker dealing with them because everybody has their role, right? Everybody has a lane and we have different channels. And so what I tell my clients is, look, let me feel them out. Let me see, because I have an opportunity to say, hey, you know, for this, this percentage of hard money in the event of an additional extension, is it reasonable? Could we even say 50K? Is that, is that close? And the lawyer, if he's represented them before, probably say, that's not going to move the needle. 50K is, is, is a rounding error. You should come at least 150. And then I'll say, okay, great. Let's not, we're not, we won't even present it. And now I can go back. And it doesn't jeopardize the total deal from yeah. broker to broker, right? Because then he gets cold feet saying, should we even go under contract with these, these guys? So there's wise. like a buffer almost between the lawyer yeah. and lawyer, which is kind it's, of it's different, out. right? Because that that lawyer, if he's represented before and he gives you that kind of whisper advice, um, and again, he, he's looking out for his client too, right? right? So we'll take that with a grain of salt. But he's not going to run to the client and say, "Do you think this buyer's serious?" Um, he's he's asking for a possible you know additional extension, and he doesn't want to put a lot of hard money for it. They're probably not going to do that. It's not part of their daily communication. But if I'm asked to do it, I can run back and report that to the client and then they can decide, okay, okay, you know, now that we have some it's additional information to allow you know, the client to make a really informed choice that um I like I like putting out there and I like helping them. Yeah. You know I, this is something I've always wanted to pose, a question I've always wanted to pose to an attorney. So here we have Ron and I, I can ask him uh, and he, he won't be offended. So <laughs> in, in my experience there there are two type of two types of real estate attorneys that one that feels as if their job is to throw up barriers to a deal, uh, in order to earn their due. Right. Um, and, and uh, the, 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 the kind way of saying that is they want to add value to the deal. Uh, the less kind way is they want to earn fees. <laughs> and so the, the more the clock is ticking, the more they earn. Uh, the other type of real estate attorney is one who recognizes they're representing the best interests of their client. And one of those interests is to get to the end, to get a deal closed. Um, and softball for you, what kind of attorney are you, Ron? Uh, <laughs> and, 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 but just opine on, I mean, <laughs> on that uh, reality. First off, do attorneys realize that clients on our end <laughs> see that happening? Um, and what are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, well, to answer the the softball, I'm definitely getting the deal done. You know, if it can be done with the changes, I like to when my clients come to me with crazy scenarios and and they really want creative solutions. I say yes, but or yes, if and, and I like to qualify. But if there's a path, I want to be the one that can lead you through it, no matter how circuitous or or dangerous or risky. But if there's a path that gets us across the finish line. Let me do my best and, and let's push it through instead of just saying, no, that won't work. Um, so, and then regards to your second point, you know, the lawyers very quickly start to see their own work as um, their calling, okay. you know, and, and I don't think they see it negative. Uh, but once they start doing that and they have a mindset, it can be very hard to break. They're very uh, defensive and they really get entrenched. Um, and so, you know, those lawyers, they, they have the clients, they, they have the long working history. And so they don't see themselves as throwing up barriers or deal killers. 
they say, oh, that's other people. I said, well, why do you think that? How many how many deals have you not had go through? Well, that's just the nature. Of me. You know, <laughs> yeah. they, 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 they kind of have blinders to their own sure. faults. And, but as long as uh, people keep hiring them, you know, I, I can't really fault their. So how approach. do you deal with an attorney on the other end? Who is clearly sl slowing down the progress? And, and, you know, and on the, by the on, way, yeah, by yeah, the way, I'm if you're not cool. watching this on video, you might want to go over to YouTube and watch this because there was some, uh, you know, gestures going around that are, you know, maybe telling. So, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, both parties on the business side want to get to the end. In most cases, I mean, maybe they're looking. It's, sometimes you'll have a buyer that's looking for an out, and the seller's looking for an out, and that's a different, a different thing. But in most cases, both parties want to get to a, an amicable conclusion. And so, what do you do in those cases where the, the attorney on the other side is making it difficult to, to get to? Yeah, a business it, uh, you know, it just takes a lot of patience. Uh, I think again. This this relates back to kind of a broader work philosophy. You know, why do you work, and and why do I go to the office and take myself away from my wife and my kid? And, and um, because we're doing these things for our client that we really believe in and that we like, again, the nature of my practice, I get to choose, I get to hire and, and fire clients. So if if there's a client that I don't really believe in and want to help, I'm going to fire them, and I and I'm just not going to work with them. So as a result, then I have a very pure stable of my clients that I will do anything for, and I will, I will sacrifice myself for them in that sense, um, and that that makes it a lot easier to deal with these people because uh, I always have the mindset: well, if I'm refusing or if I find it difficult to deal with this person, how would my client deal with them? How would another lawyer who maybe has less patience for him? Um, because uh, you know, I'll tell you, you know, I've, I've gotten some expletive filled voicemails. <laughs> sure, yeah. I've gotten, I've, I've gotten lawyers that refuse to let me talk, which is very interesting is, okay, we're trying to negotiate. There's been some, some term or some change and we're, I call the lawyer or the lawyer calls me and, and they don't even let me talk and they just want to rant and they just want to vent and they want to threaten and say, if you do this, we're going to sue you so fast and, and we're going to do this and your client's going to pay and all this and you better, you know, effing <laughs> not do it. They strong and, arm you. I mean, it's, to me, it's not effective. It's really right. ineffective to have so much anger or so much lack of emotional control because again, you know, again, I, lawyers would say he's an advocate where he's a really zealous yeah. advocate for his client, and that's how his client feels. But the lawyer is, is again, that buffer that should be able to uh, portray the threat in a very effective manner. And if somebody comes up to me and is screaming at my face, you know, this is like on the street, and it's, oh, I'm going to kill you, like, oh, I'm going to punch you, and I'm going to yeah. stab you, and I'm going to you know burn down your house, and they're just yelling at my face and spit flying. But nothing happens. You you tend to think it's okay, right? This yeah. person's just just clearly upset. They're they're um, venting, but repeated crazy threats and then nothing follow through. You're kind of I, you know I relax. I kind of like this guy is a little off base, but I'm not in danger. Versus if you had somebody come up to you on the street and just whisper, Spencer. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> that is terrifying. That that really is is the counter. It's premeditated. It's oh, it's it deliberate. Yeah. It's not uncontrolled and <laughs> yes. Yeah. And it's and it's a person that's really you know maybe gonna gonna carry through. And so that's the same thing with the lawyer, right? Okay. So when yeah. the lawyer comes at you and is throwing up roadblocks and then just you know spouting all these uh, threats. Well, if you're really gonna do those things and and it really is gonna bring that harm, you should convey it. So that they really clearly understand, but you don't need to go over the top and and threaten them with you know they're going to ruin your business and they're going to go bankrupt. It's like okay, we know what the logical outcome of of a big judgment is. You know you can state why you think that, but it should be very calm to try to not to talk some sense into this person because uh, lawyer to lawyer, we're not the client. It's not our 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 equity on the table, and. They should just say, look, you know, you really got to go to your client and show him that you shouldn't do this because yeah. if you do, we're going to be forced to do this and it's not going to end well and we want to work it out. Um, yeah. You know, I'll, I'll say something that representatives of clients and, and I say representative because one is a legal representation. 
uh, brokers as well play this role. Uh, they set the client's tone in a lot of cases. And so the client is irate when they're led to believe by their broker or their attorney that they have a reason to be irate. And, and so I've found, and, and this is more on, on the broker side, especially um, when they set the proper tone for their client, uh, and maybe that's that filter you're talking about, um, the client is relaxed and, and the other side of the deal uh, has a much easier time getting to the end versus when they have representation uh, that, that kind of sets them off. It just causes problems that in most cases are unnecessary, right? Uh, we're all just trying to get to the end of the deal. Uh, right. Right. Well, I, so I kind of wonder about the flip side of this dynamic. Okay, so there's the lawyer to lawyer. What about the investor to lawyer? I'm sure you get investors anywhere from novice to experienced. And I'm guessing, I, I, I'm just curious, what are... When you're working with the more beginner, the novice, what are some of the common pitfalls and things you are navigating with that person, helping them understand to try and get them up to that level? And again, help them get the deal done and re represent their best interest. Right. I think that's a, that's a very common part of my practice. So the, the best advice I have is for people to really put their thoughts and their goals for this investment um, you know, onto paper or into an email. Because without knowing what your goals are for this transaction or how it fits into your broader portfolio, I can't make risk assessments and I can't accurately convey them or price them so that it's it's efficient for you. And, and I mean that on both directions. You know, if if this is a twenty million dollar deal and it's it's really important and for whatever reason it's critical to hit and and you definitely have, I won't say. Uh, you know, notice, but but you have some inkling of some areas. You know, bring those to the attorney and say we want to spend a little bit extra time reviewing this because we think or we're concerned about risk of this. It's a critical part of our underwriting, for example. Um, but being able to convey that to the lawyer shows that you have thought about it and you're um, you're very clear on what you need from the lawyer, and you can ask them. I want your advice on what the hard money should be on an extension and and say that and and you don't have to you know do exactly what they what they recommend but you take your advice from your broker you take the advice from the lawyer but you got to ask for it and you got to tell them very clearly okay i'm a novice these are the things that i know i know my business i know my goals i know my x these are the things i don't know about this transaction and how they differ um, you know, if, if somebody's been doing new construction residential and, and they're always used to like very short turn rates, um, you know, like on their debt, they might come to me and say, okay, but now I have this commercial building I'm going to build and, and lease up. How is that different? I'm not sure how the banks deal with me differently. And I'll say, great, you know, that's, that's a really common, um, change and the banks in general, they'll give you longer terms, but then even if you go past that, you know, I, if I advise that my banking clients, my banking friends can disagree, but they're not <laughs> going to foreclose immediately. You basically just get punted over into the workouts and then you can still kind of work it out. This is assuming, yeah. you know, you're making yeah. payments, right? But in terms of calling the, the rest of the note, the balloon. So that should give them a little bit more comfort. Is like, okay, I can build this, I can lease it. And if I hit the end of my 18 month interest only, it's not like hitting a wall where I think uh, residential lenders would be like, okay, boom, we're foreclosing. We're, we're rolling on top of you. We're, we're going to take back our collateral. The commercial banks, the lenders, they're not going to jump into that right away. Yeah. They're going to say, you're making the payments. What's going on? You know, I'm at 50% you know, occupancy. I'm willing to sell it now. It's on the market, but I'm still trying to lease it up more. And they say, okay, well, kind of continue to work with you but you're on our, our bad list but you're not foreclosed and you're yeah, not losing the you're not losing title uh which is a huge difference you know in a recession is, is keep title of your property yeah. kind of like the, well, this is senior debt if you get into more yeah 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 <laughs> oh, See, sorry, sorry. Sorry. if you get into mez debt things yeah. like that they're there can they're, be aggressive they're yeah. waiting yeah. for yeah. that yeah sorry so yeah just <laughs> well clarify. you know i'm really excited uh to have ron uh contributing to our acre legal section um I learned 
few things about Ron I didn't know. Yeah. Uh, Sam? Give us a little bit of context and insight into it. So that was a really good episode. Thank you for being here, Ron. And again, we will have more content coming from him, both on the audio series as well as uh, the website. So tune into that and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Adventures in CRE audio series. For show notes and additional resources, head over to www.adventuresincre.com slash audio series. Would you like to learn real estate financial modeling in a matter of weeks and do it with zero guesswork? If so, the ACRE Accelerator is for you. The Accelerator is a step-by-step, case-based program designed to teach you exactly what you need to know and in the order you need to know it, so you can gain both the knowledge and experience to take your career to the next level. To see if the Accelerator is right for you, go to www.adventuresincre.com accelerator.